Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Each week, we hear real-time stories from athletes and CEOs on how to maximize performance through an endurance mindset. Let's get started. Well, welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Today's guest has 30 years of healthcare experience and serves on several national boards. His first book, Be the Best Part of Their Day, will be published next month or probably around this recording release. He is the president and CEO of the Kathleen Shaw Betha Hospital. Please welcome David Shiner. Welcome, David. Greg, it is so nice to meet you. I see your role as father and husband and Iron Man and owner of your own business. Uh, you you check a lot of boxes, my friend. Good for you. I'm trying my best. Um, it, it keeps me busy, to say the least. Uh, anyways, I love talking about endurance and the endurance mindset. David, tell me how your endurance mindset has impacted your life unexpectedly. The part that was so surprising for me, Greg, is the the people along the way. And I don't necessarily even mean the people that I met, but I think about whether it was during a marathon or doing, during a triathlon and that encouragement that you receive in those final miles from people that you've never met before and you'll never meet again. It might be the most positive environment on earth. And I try to carry some of that over to my professional world, but just the people that are supporting you that have never met you before. And, you know, we don't always like to hear that you're almost finished at 20 miles, but they say it with a great big smile on their face and they're giving you high fives. And, and that type of energy is just something that was life changing for me. It's so true. And you made my skin tingle just remembering those because when you are at mile 20 and they think you're really close to the finish, you know, that you're nowhere close to the finish. <laughs> It's so, three races, right? It's first 10, second 10, and last 10K. And uh, that last 10K is not equal to the other two. That's exactly right. Um, so I, I, tell me how that you've applied that to other parts of your life. I think the energy, Greg, is something that I try to bring, um, whether we're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation or small group meeting or even presenting on the stage. Uh, energy is infectious. And I think to take enthusiasm and take the, the best part of people, trying to find the positives in people and, and talk about that, to be able to celebrate people and the work that they're doing is so important. And I don't think we can do enough of that. You know, life is hard in so many ways. And to have someone show gratitude and maybe ask you to pause for a second and think about all the things that are that you're doing that are, are really life changing. You know, as we talked about when we started, you look at some of those boxes that you check. You know, I hope you get a chance to set back every once in a while and say, I'm doing the things that are really important to me. I'm following my passion. And that's a real gift. It 100 percent is a real gift. Um, let's talk about how that in context of managing a team, I suspect your team that you look over and support is pretty significant. Talk to us about team management and how you bring that energy and that positivity to your team. It's so much fun to see that everybody responds to energy differently, right? There are some people that might be on the low energy scale and that's the way they operate their life. And that's harder for me to connect with those people. But I also take that on as a challenge to try to understand enough about them to know when that energy can be positive for them and when it might even be annoying, if that's the right word, Greg. And then trying to, you know, again, it's um, with the people that report directly to me. So in my case, I'm the CEO of a hospital. That would be the vice president's. I know them closely enough that I believe I have an understanding of how to motivate them and what gets them excited. And I want to play to their strengths. I want to make sure that I put them in a position to succeed by bringing that energy when it's uh, additive to them and and maybe dialing that back for me personally when it might not be for them. It, it's not about me. It's about what serves them best and allows them to be able to succeed in their position. So how do you identify their energy level? You ask. Mm. I, I don't mean that to be a smart aleck answer, but it's really um, it's observation and it's asking what's important to them. It's asking how they like to be recognized. I have one person from my team that uh, we could promote this person at any time and they would love that. And there's another member that if you did that, um, he or she would just hide under the desk and wouldn't want any part of it. And so we need to know that. And I think part of that is asking, just having that conversation of how can I best serve you? Uh, what's the one thing that I can do right now for you that makes everything else easier? And as you think about going back to the endurance mindset, how do you see that show up in your in your teams? 
you and I had a conversation earlier um, off camera about that idea of enjoying the process of training, enjoying the development of putting a plan together. And I think that's something that we talk a lot about with our team. Um, our business, our hospital is on a calendar year fiscal year. So we've gone through the process over the last several months about dreaming what 2024 will look like. And that's exciting for me. That that fills my bucket to be able to talk about where we're having successes and how we might place multipliers on that success, whether for us that's around patient engagement or clinical quality or staff engagement. How do we take advantage of those wins and where do we look that we're struggling or where we have opportunities for improvement? What are some things that we can put in place? So it's not much different than the periodization of endurance training where you know you can't just go all out 12 months. You have to find ways that you can make impact and you also have to find ways that you can allow people to dial back just a little bit and recover so that they can build that muscle, so to speak, moving forward. Does that make sense, Greg, the way I'm explaining it? It does. And I was going to ask you around recovery, as a leader of a team, how do you, how do you put that into your cycle? into your planning cycle or into your execution cycle? Sure. Uh, where I am in my career, you know, I can probably see the clubhouse from here. I don't know if I'm on the 18th hole yet, but uh, I'm on the back nine. Let's put it that way. And we have some younger people on our senior executive team. And, and our chief human resource officer came up with the idea of working four tens. Now, in my world, that's completely foreign to me because I'm kind of a 10 or a 12 hour day guy, five or six days a week. But we put that in place and it's been huge. It's been a huge win for our team because it, I've seen them recharge by having that three day weekend occasionally and then coming back and they're more effective on those days that they're here. So that's something that five years earlier I would have never agreed to because it didn't fit for my own DNA. But in listening to the team, it was the right thing for them. And I think having that willingness to be open to new ideas and trying things. And we tried this, Greg, with that idea that, you know, let's do it for a few months and let's reevaluate it every two or three months and make sure it's still serving the organization and it's still serving each of us. And so far it is. You know, the recovery aspects in training and in leadership is so important, right? Like sleep, recovery, rest, meditation, um, any other discoveries that you've recently come across, you know, similar to the four tens that as your team has grown or as you've advanced through your career that that kind of shocked you that you didn't expect that you would agree to now that you wouldn't have agreed to 10 years ago? Yeah, first back to the recovery, if I can, for just one second. I don't know if this was true for you, but that was a late discovery for me. When I was early on in endurance sports, it was the the more training I could get in, the more volume. I, I wanted to work harder than everybody else, and that was going that was just how I was going to reach my goals. It took me a long time to understand that recovery could positively impact that. But to answer your question, the, the thing for me that I discovered a little bit later as well is I was rewarded throughout my entire career by doing things, by taking challenges, taking problems, taking opportunities and fixing them, the, the doing part of the business. And I found out that I can actually have a greater impact by being present. So it's the being versus doing. And that idea of being there for them, asking great questions, that's one of the things that we talk about in my book, and trying to get them to places where I could never go. And if you have the right talent on your team, I think that idea of being in service to them as opposed to solving things for them can really be accretive towards goals. And it took me a long time to figure that out. Let's dig into your book, your, your upcoming book. Um, but before we get into the content, I'd love to understand your motivation for writing it, for what the publishing process has been. Give us some experience share on on the publishing side of, of developing your book. Yeah, I was very fortunate to work with Forbes and they had a great mousetrap. They had a business plan that was very, very effective and it was very prescriptive. So we're going to do these things in this order. And that works with my mindset. It worked very well for me. Uh, my book is based on my doctoral dissertation. So I was really at about, you know, I was in the red zone before I started on the book. I'd already gone the 80 yards through my dissertation to do the research and to know what I found in my research that is something that I think is very applicable for, for people, not only in healthcare, but in all businesses. And so the book was the last 20%. 
And it was a blast to write, and it's really been fun promoting it. The promotion part is something that um, I did not necessarily lean into, but as I'm doing a little bit more of it, I'm really having fun with it. Um, so let's dig into some content. Is there any tidbits? Get us excited about jumping onto Amazon after this podcast to, to buy the book or to pre-buy it. So what I did, Greg, is uh, I went out and I interviewed leaders from five different health systems around the country. And what I was looking for is, are there communication traits that are common between great leaders? And so I would interview the leader and then I would interview five members of their team to confirm that what the leader said was going on was actually happening. And I found that there were three common pieces that all of these leaders did. The first was engage and connect at a personal level. The second was engaging with intent through various mediums. And the third was be mission focused through United Leadership. So in each of these three categories, there are five subheadings under each one, if that makes sense. So if you mm -hmm. think three in general and then five subcomponents. And so just one example of that is engaging, connecting at a personal level. I give examples about asking great questions to generate positivity. And I can tell stories in the book about what are examples of that. And how can you take that and build that into your leadership toolkit so that you can more meaningfully engage with the people that matter the most? And the thing that was really fun with this is I found that it works at work and it also works at home. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife is so tired of being a Petri dish on all of the things that I bring home and try out on her. Uh, but between my wife and my, my adult children, uh, they're pretty much used to it at this point. And uh, it, it'll go for a while and they'll say, oh, yeah, I get it. I see what you're doing here. But it, it really is effective. And if we can if we can engage more meaningful and more meaningfully with the people that matter the most, I know my life has been enriched from that. Mm -hmm. Can you share one of the stories from the book? Yeah, I would love to. So um, one of the things uh, in the book is around finding ways to express gratitude. So I was speaking with a healthcare leader in the Northeast, and he described for me that he comes from a large Catholic family. And the way that they celebrate is through meals with food. And so within his organization, they look for things to celebrate, and then they have parties around that. And so he'll bring his executive team in, he'll bring his board of directors in, and they'll serve the staff at the hospital. And he went so far as to say, if they go a couple, two, three months, and they don't have anything to celebrate, they'll make something up. So uh, for, and one way that we've implemented that is um, this morning, myself and our chief financial officer were here at the hospital at 3.30 in the morning, and we had a meal for third shift because we just don't get to see them that often. And it's around the holidays and we just, uh, we meet them, we take food up to them from our own cafeteria and we tell them that we appreciate what we what they do. We love them for the way that they take care of our patients and we're proud of them. And our people need to hear that. So I, I think those ways of expressing gratitude, everybody has a little bit different way of doing it, but it's, it's very meaningful in today's environment. Absolutely. Um, I love that idea. And, and you're in your second shift for the day, if that's how early you started. Um, talk to us about how that translates into patient care and to health. Yes, the, it's unequivocally true that the only way you get to great patient engagement is through great employee engagement. There's no way to disconnect those two. If you don't have staff that are passionate about the mission, that want to serve our patients and their families, then there's no way that you can get the type of health care that the people deserve. And we're an independent rural hospital, so we're taking care of people often that are friends and uh, you know, they, they may go to the same church, they may have kids in the same school. Um, it's a small community. And that ability to take care of each other is really important to us. I mean, we only have 950 employees, um, 80 beds. It's a relatively small hospital. But we know that if we take care of our employees, our team, in the best way possible, they're going to provide great care. Uh, one of the taglines that we have for KSB Hospital is, it's the people. And we've had that tagline since the early 2000s. And I've tried to kill it like 15 different times with a new slogan. And our employees keep resurrecting it and bringing it back because it's so meaningful to them. So I finally learned, stop that, lean into it. And that comment of it's the people is really part of our organizational culture here in our organization. That's a, a great tagline. So for us audience members who only experience the hospital from the patient perspective, Give us some insights of what it's like from 
the management perspective, the doctor's perspective, the the employee's perspective, like what's the what should we know as a community who utilizes our hospitals for our health? What should we know that's going on in the back the back behind the scenes? I love you asking that great question, Greg, because it's it's such a different mood than it was. So let me paint this picture very quickly for you. If you think back to when the COVID pandemic started, at least in our community, there were signs in people's yards that were talking about healthcare heroes, right? These are the people that had a pandemic, a virus that we didn't know that much about. And these healthcare workers are running into the burning building to help their patients. And they were scared about taking the disease home to their family members. Um, we didn't know at the time about how that disease process would run. Was there long-term COVID? You know, it was all a huge unknown. And so we had people in our organization, we had companies that were bringing food into the hospital. I, you'll see there's a theme there, right? I talked about food a lot. Food. <laughs> <laughs> but there were people coming to the hospital and bringing things and saying how much they appreciated us. That's two, two and a half years ago. And now over that very short period of time, healthcare in the United States is moving to the place where a recent Wall Street Journal study reported that over 70 percent don't trust their healthcare providers. So in less than three years, we went from healthcare heroes to people that we want to question and not trust. And there's a lot of reason behind all of that. But the secret sauce to all of it is, for the most part, the people that you encounter when you come into the hospital, they want to provide great care for you. And they want to be your partner in care. They want to help you to understand the disease process that you're going through or the injury that you've experienced. And they want to help you through that in a successful way. And I think the thing that gets in the way are all the, and I understand this, but all of the billing questions and the timeliness and access to care, those are things our industry has to get much better at. And, and I think we are marginally, but that reason for being is the same as it was 130 years ago when our organization started about 100 yards away from where I'm standing right now. That's really insightful. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the pandemic how has that changed your future planning, your strategic planning, and how you look at the next 100 years of your hospital? Now, I had mentioned, Greg, that uh, KSB Hospital is an independent rural hospital, and we went into the pandemic with a very strong balance sheet, and we don't have that anymore. Um, because of many things that happened during the pandemic, um, some of that had to do with restrictions on care that we could provide. Um, some of it was the expense side of the equation. Um, we were paying up to $215 an hour for agency nurses to work in our organization. And so we went from a very strong cash position to a not very strong cash position. And we're trying to recover from that. And that's a threat to our ability to remain independent. So we're trying to decide right now how we best serve our community. And today, our board's um, goal is to remain independent and serve our patients that way. And we have to see what that looks like moving forward. Shifting gears slightly, tell us about you. Like, I'd love to know where you grew up, what environment you were in, how you ended up being the CEO and president of this hospital. Give us your story. Yeah, um, I'll start at the end of undergrad, Greg. So um, I graduated uh, from a D1 school. I ran track there and uh, I basically majored in track and fraternity. So I got out of undergrad and had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I went to Eastern Illinois University and I, uh, I went to visit my mom in Kansas and I was playing in a pickup basketball game. And the director of that program was playing and told me that he had a person drop out on that Friday. So they had an open slot and I started class on Monday morning and I loved every bit of it. I loved the clinical side. I loved being in the hospital. I loved the environment. And so that led to a, a career in 1989. My uh, wife and I came here to Dixon, Illinois. Um, we were in the Kansas City area and for a little while in Missouri. And it was supposed to be a two-year gig, and in April, that will be 35 years ago. And I've been CEO since 2011, so I came as our director of medical imaging and just had progressive uh, opportunities through the years. And we never found a reason to leave. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about CEO positions in healthcare is the average turnover is 3.4 years. And we've been in a situation where our kids were able to grow up without moving every three and a half years. Um, my son was born here. My daughter was only a couple years old when we moved to town. So um, it's really worked out great. And I feel very blessed to be in an organization that I love a great deal. 
She was born in that in your hospital. My son was born here. Yeah, I was your the son. director at the time. So I literally walked upstairs. Andrew came into the world. My wife wanted to get a little rest. So I worked that afternoon. So it worked out kind of neat. That's awesome. I'd love to know what you do for fun. Right, Greg? What's that? So much for paternity leave, right? That was maybe a different time. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'd love to know what you do for fun. Yeah, unfortunately, um, physically, I'm not able to do the endurance stuff anymore. So um, golf has become a passion. I, I put the same level of energy into golf that I do into uh, that I did into endurance sports. And um, so I'm, I'm really enjoying that a great deal. I, I do like writing. I like speaking. Um, those are things that are passions for me as well. And it, it's taking some of these ideas and some of these best practices and sharing it. Um, that's also something that fills up my cup. If I have the chance to speak to a group and I find one or two people, they get back to me later and say, I took one of your concepts or a couple of your concepts and it was really it was meaningful for me i felt like it made a difference that's a that's a big thing for me so are you active on uh keynote speaking are you on the speaker circuit is that something you're looking to do in the future um i would use the word emerging how's that <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying I've, I've done a lot of speaking within the healthcare space and i've had the opportunity over the last year or so to build that outside of healthcare. Um, for banks, for um, there was a, a payroll company that I did a presentation for recently that was so much fun. Um, so those are things that I enjoy doing. And uh, I'm, I'm looking for those opportunities. And I'm also looking for individuals and teams to work with just to share some of these ideas about being the best part of people's days. And, and what can you do to make life a little bit better for the people that matter the most to you? Can you give us a little bit more content on that? Like, what is the concept that somebody would walk away from one of your presentations? Well, I, I hope that they take one of these 15 boxes that we talked about earlier, Greg. And one of the things I talked about in my presentation is what are you going to do in the next 24 hours? So if it's around a concept of asking great questions, I give some tools around how to do that. What are ways that you can ask questions to make people feel valued, to make sure that they know you care about them? They're closest to the work. And we want to learn from them. We want to remove obstacles that are keeping them from performing at the level that they want to perform or be additive, put something in their world that as leaders, we have the opportunity to do. So I'm just hoping that somebody finds one or two of those boxes and gives a shot and it works. And I'm finding as I get the opportunity to speak to people that that's largely the case. And then the more of the boxes that they do, it's a multiplier, right? So if they're if we were to do this assessment and today you were doing seven of the 15 categories, what's your world look like if you're able to do 10 or 11 or 12? Which really brings you back to our conversation around endurance racing and planning, right? If we start with six boxes are checked right, right now and we could add one more over the next 30 days and add another one over the next 30 days. But to your point you made initially, do it with intention then we can grow. Any thoughts on that or any uh, additional content you want to put around that? Yeah, I have such a big smile on my face because I love working with athletes so much because you talk to an athlete and you talk about, okay, maybe you're checking six of the boxes and, you know, they want 15. They're not going to settle at 12. They're not going to settle at 13. You know, our endurance mindset is we want to do everything we can to put ourselves in a place for success. And so that I, I love working with people that are competitive. Uh, because again, we just, I think we want to grow faster. I think we're willing to put the work in and we know that, you know, there often is a direct correlation between activity and, uh, and that work, maybe doing the things that other people aren't willing to do. And some of this, some of the successes that can relate with that, that can result from that. So a, a random question popped into my head, um, around athletics and exercise and over your 30 years of experience, has there been an unexpected benefit from, from athletes and, and having an active exercise routine in your life? Yeah, my routine is in the morning, Greg. So that's a, you know, I get up about 4.30. I, I do a workout before I go to work. And I find that on the days that I'm unable to do that, and you probably hear this from so many of your guests, I heard it in some of the podcasts that I listen to. When I don't get that workout in the morning, my day is completely different. 
And like many of your other guests, some of the best ideas that I've had, you know, I may only have one or two really good ideas a year, but many of those originate while I'm in the pool or while I'm on the bike or now just out for a walk. And for me, because of that, I intentionally don't listen to music or listen to podcasts or anything while I'm working out because I found that that silence is something that I don't get very much of during my day. And so to have that while I'm exercising, while I'm working out is really meaningful for me. You know, you really just lit up a light bulb for me. Um, when I train, I don't listen to music because I know race day, I'm not going to have it. But to your point that you just made, and it's fantastic, it really allows you, your brain to come up with a great idea or a new way of thinking because you're not being distracted by a podcast or music. Um, and, and you've really got me thinking about that. So thank you. Um, well, you know, Greg, the way that that started for me, it, it was during the Ironman training when I went from marathons to triathlons. And like like many triathletes, it was because I was an injured runner. And that's how I got into doing triathlons. And one of the things that I found is that when I began hurting, when I began noticing that something was wrong, I, I did better when I was focused on it. Does that make sense? So instead mm -hmm. of having the music and you start having a little bit of knee pain or you feel something that just that just isn't right without that outside distraction, I felt like I was more present and in the moment and I could react in a more meaningful way. And I think that happens at work. You know, the equivalent of that for me at work is finding that time between meetings to refocus a little bit and make sure that even though one meeting that ended at 10 o'clock with a surgeon that might have been unhappy about something in the OR, and I follow that with a, an 11 o'clock meeting with a housekeeper who I want to congratulate on having their 25th year of service here at KSB, I need to bring it to both meetings. And the person that, I, that, that I'm meeting at 11 o'clock doesn't deserve to have a hangover from the meeting that I had at 10. It's very well said. Um, David, I'm, I'm really curious, when did this mindfulness, this being present happen to you in your life? Like, when did all these learnings that you're now talking about and publishing a book around sort of come to life for you? Yeah, I, I began in 2019 when I had a lunch with a friend of mine and I shared with him that even though our hospital was doing well and we were hitting our key performance indicators and I just actually signed a contract renewal personally, I just didn't feel like I was earning the compensation that I got. I didn't feel as if I was performing in the way that I wanted to. And then the pandemic hit after that. And the whole world changed for all of us, right, inside and outside of healthcare. And through all of that, I, I discovered that I needed to find time to slow things down a little bit, to take a little bit of time to just be focused on where I was in the moment. And that was a new experience for me. I was always thinking a month ahead, a quarter ahead, a year ahead. If I was in a meeting with you, I was thinking about my next meeting. And it really, through my doctoral studies, through my research that I did, I I've really discovered how much of a disservice I was doing to people when I wasn't with them. And so that's what I focus on now. I want to be the best part of their day. I want you to go home afterwards and say, I had a meeting with Dave today and here's what we talked about. And, you know, have that excitement with your wife, with your kids that if we could all do that for one or two people every day, it's pretty exciting to me to think about what our communities would look like. I can tell you 100% that I'm going to have that conversation with my family this afternoon. I was like, I just recorded this podcast with Dave and and here's my inspiration and my palms were sweaty and it was, it's fantastic. Oh, um, wow. You made my day saying that, Greg. Thank you for mm -hmm. that. That's exciting. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we've got many athletes in our audience. Um, so as a healthcare provider, any insights, any tidbits that we should be thinking or changes in the industry that we should know about? Within healthcare specifically, you mean, Greg? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think especially for athletes and endurance athletes are even in a different category. You know your body so well and, and you know what makes you tick. And I used that word partnership earlier. I, I really think you want to go in with any provider and, and be a partner on the team and do something with the provider and not have something done to you. You know, the days of going in and the doctor says, you're going to go back and do one, two, and three. There should be some education around that. There should be that, that provider, whether it's a, a surgeon or your family medicine physician, should say, here's what we're going to do. Here's 
why we're going to do it. And does that resonate with your personal goals? I think that's so important to find, keep looking and find that provider that has that mindset that you do. You know, you don't go to Greg after doing eight Ironmans that has a knee injury and say, take three months off. Mm. And that, that happened in the past. You know, let's focus on what you can do and not what you can't do. Maybe you're going to spend more time in the pool. Maybe you'll spend a little bit more time in the bike and not be able to run. But let's let's talk about what you can achieve while you're going through whatever you're going through. That's really well said. And it it also applies to our coaches, right? We, we want the coach that, that can adjust our training plan according to our recent performance, any upcoming injury. Um, you know, Dave, you, met, you really hit a chord for me. Like I, my healthcare provider, this guy, Dr. Habib, saved my life two years ago when he found out that I had a pulmonary embolism. And the only reason I discovered that, one, I was short of breath, but it was because of my endurance training that I was like, hey, this isn't normal. I need to go talk to somebody. And I went and talked. And he did take, and he does take that partnership approach. And anytime I get the chance to thank him, I obviously do. And um, so to your point, right, understanding your body, understanding your, where your limits are, understanding where your your healthcare provider is on your team and your coach, et cetera, is super important. There's so much to unpack from that, Greg. And I, I'm glad that that was discovered because that's a the hair raised on the back of my neck when you said that. But that idea of knowing your body and saying, hey, something's wrong, because we often try to say, hey, I'm just tired or I'm coming off of a bad race or the last training didn't go well. It'll get better. And, you know, a month later, we're still dealing with it. But the other thing that I thought of as you were saying that is that happens to the people that we work with as well. And if we have a teammate that is going through a divorce or perhaps they have a, a, a child that's struggling or they're just in a place like I was in 2019 where they're they're just not performing the way that they want to. I think we need to talk about that as well and support them and be there for them and partner with them to try to help them through that as opposed to, you know, what it, what my world used to be of just put your head down and grind through it. Mm. Shifting topics slightly, I'd love to get into mental health and what you're seeing. You know, I mean, there's a ton of news. A lot of people are talking about it post pandemic. Um, any insights there for our audience? Yeah, Greg, the thing that I worry the most about are our kids. And I see what our children went through in the pandemic and I see how they were taken out of social settings. Um, some of them for in a time that was some of the most developmentally important time in their lives. So you think about kids that were perhaps juniors and seniors in high school when the pandemic hit and all of the pressures that they had around not just the academic part, but I mean, sports were taken away from them in some cases and other cultural activities they, that they might've been involved in. And then they're playing, they're applying for colleges and they're reading all the time that kids are coming into college now. They're not prepared academically. And this is pressure that you're putting on these 18 and 19 and 17 year old kids. And so when we talk to our family medicine physicians here, they've told me that if you think about their day, so you might see 20 patients, for example, if you're a family medicine physician, over 50% of those have a component of mental health in that visit. When you think about that for just a second, so if you see 20 people throughout the day, in addition to runny nose or sore knee, they also have something going on from a mental perspective that they, it, it's so significant to them that they talk about it with their physician. And, and that's such an important part of the research that I do and the writing that I do is, is there anything we can do to make that day just a little bit easier? You know, if it's a, a pat on the back or a high five or, or telling them about something that they did really great with truthfulness and specificity, specificity and positivity. Can we help just that much to help people turn that corner? Because it's hard. Everybody's going through a lot. I think that awareness of kindness and love is super important more than ever. You know, as a parent, um, are the things that we should be looking out for in our kids related to their mental health and sort of the post-pandemic new way, new life? Yeah, I'm certainly not an expert on that, Greg, and I don't want to overstep my bounds. But what I hear from the people that I work with is the most important thing is to look for change, to look for your, your son or your daughter that is, is just different in some way and to begin those conversations and make sure that if necessary, they have access to people that can help them. And I, 
I believe and I'm encouraged by the fact that that help does not have some of the same stigma that it might have had a few years ago. Uh, reaching out to a mental health professional. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing. And I mean, I've done it personally throughout my life and I greatly benefited from that. And I try to encourage people through an employee assistance program or in conversations with their primary care provider about just let it out there. Let people know how you're feeling and, and if we can help. But with our kids, you know, you watch them closely and you love them and you, you watch for any type of a change that might be important. That's very, very helpful. Um, David, an audience member wants to get in touch with you. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Sure. Um, David at KSBHospital.com is an email. I also have a website at DrDavidSchreiner.com. And I'm out there on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram and all those other social places you're supposed to be. But probably the website, Greg, is the easiest place to start. And I am really excited about the book launch that's happening in January. And that's available now on Amazon. Wonderful. And we'll include those in our show notes for sure. Is there any way our audience could support your hospital? Well, the greatest thing is that, that a portion of proceeds from the book are going to the KSB Hospital Foundation. So um, I've been at the hospital, as I mentioned, for 35 years. They've been wonderful to me, and I'm hoping to give back. And so a way to do that is to buy the book, do a review on Amazon. If you find something that is of interest to you, I'd love to come in and speak with your teams. Um, I did a presentation for a group Monday night. Um, one member that was there bought 50 books and signed me up to do an hour uh, Teams call with their staff. So those kind of things help our hospital. And I appreciate you asking that, Greg. That's that's very kind of you. Of course. Dave, it's been awesome having you on the show. I, I really could talk to you for hours and hours and hours. And I do feel that engagement that you talk about in your book and your learnings. Um, I really appreciate the light bulb that went on when we talked about the silence when we're training and what that allows our brain to do. Um, our conversations around asking great questions to be engaged in that, and our gratitude for individuals and, and between each other. Um, I'm super excited to see your book. You know, it, I can't wait to have that arrive on my door. Um, it's been great having you on the show, Dave. I really appreciate your time. Well, you're very skilled at summarizing, Greg, and keep doing the work that you're doing. It's important. And for all of us that listen to your podcast and follow your work, you're making a difference. And I appreciate you very much. I appreciate that. And audience members, please like the show. Please subscribe to this podcast. If you got some value out of this conversation, please share it with your community. Let's expand this community. Let's get this message further and further out so we can keep impacting people's lives. Thank you again, Dave. Thank you for the opportunity. Great to talk with you, Greg. Thank you for tuning in to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. To hear more inspiring stories and strategies around the endurance mindset, be sure to subscribe below or visit us at chiefenduranceofficer.com. Until next time, keep pushing those limits.